Warning, this is not a podcast for those who have got it together. We are men seeking answers to the questions that have plagued our mind. Can we be undefeated? Okay, thank you guys for tuning into our podcast. Um, you are listening to Positively Undefeated. And uh, I'm here with Deshauna. Hi, how are you? Thank you so much for taking the time to to talk with us. I just want to take a few minutes and point everybody to our website, which is evenoneless.com. It's uh, it's kind of a work in progress, but um, it definitely it will give you some resources, and also it will give you um, uh, how to contact us. You can email us. You can call us. Uh, we'd love the interaction. Please follow this podcast and review it. Those things help us get the message out. And also, I want to remind everybody about an event in September, which is September 16th. Deshaun, are you coming? That'd be great. So we're having a mixer event. It is really an introduction to our new not-for-profit. I think most of you guys know that you know suicide has um, profoundly impacted my family and my life, and so we decided we wanted to do something about it. So we started a not-for-profit, even one less. And we're going to have a introduction event, Mixer. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to have uh, music. We're going to have a food truck. We're going to have a fun auction. I know one of those items that we're auctioning off is uh, a trip for two, I want to say, to Mexico, to Cancun. And uh, we've got some other cool items that we're going to auction off. And so I think we're going to have some great speakers and just good information. So we want, if you guys are in this area, we're in Western Oklahoma, Elk City, Oklahoma. It's going to be at 105 South Main, which is at the United Country Exploration Realty Office in downtown Elk City. Great. Uh, again, I appreciate you being on the podcast. Um, first of all, tell me what you do for work. <laughs> Let's start there. Well, um, my name is Deshauna Smythe, and I am the brand new coalition coordinator for Beckham County, Washita County, and Caddo County. And what it is, is um, the Department of Mental Health Substance Abuse um, has given SWOTA a grant. So I'm, em I'm employed by SWOTA and by the grant, um, but they've given grants for each county for substance abuse um, prevention. So Beckham County has a high rate of opioid overdoses as well as marijuana misuse. So our um, coalitions, which are multiple different agencies and, and just regular people come together um, to f fight the overdoses really and to prevent any further death from happening. Um, we get together once a month and we go over um, things that could actually help events that we could go to. We give out lock bags, lock boxes for medications. Um, it, you can lock up your opioids or you can lock up your marijuana. Either way, there's been several um, children who have ended up in our ERs that um, have ingested their parents' marijuana or their parents' opioids. Um, and also, too, it protects your uh, medications from being stolen, especially when you travel or if you're a grandparent and you've got kids in the house that might get into your stuff. We're trying to prevent that. And so we give out um, disposal bags for medication. Um, we do Narcan training. We give out Narcan for free. Um, SWOTA is our hub in Western Oklahoma. It's located at 420 Sooner Road in um, Burns Flat. And you can come to us and you can get trained for Narcan. That way, not only do we want to prevent suicides with one less, but one less overdose as well. Yeah, for sure. I didn't realize, I mean, you, you don't really realize the, how big a deal like the drug problem is. And then it's funny because on the, like we live right off I-40 and you see on I-40, you talk about like billboards about fentanyl, how fentanyl, and do you, and I don't really understand it. It talks about like tests first. Do you understand that? Yes, I do. So what happens is there are several people who are buying um, things like Oxycontin, Oxycodone off the streets, Percocet. They're looking for opioids. Fentanyl is an opioid, but it is actually not made with opium. It's chemically based only, so anybody can make it in their home. It's very, very cheap. It takes just a pencil tip to actually overdose on and die. 
Um, so, uh, there are dealers out there that are coming together that, um, make these fake Oxycontin and Oxycodone Percocet pills. And it's actually just full of fentanyl and it's enough fentanyl to kill 10 people. And so you think that you're just taking a 10 milligram Percocet when really you're getting a crap ton of fentanyl. So how do they, I mean, and you may not know, but I'm just curious every time I see that billboard, I'm like, how do you test? So they're actual fentanyl test strips. We give those out as well. Mm -hmm. Um, And you can take and break off a little piece of, of, your opioid. Mm-hmm. If you're not wanting fentanyl in your opioids, then you put it in a little cup with a little bit of water mm-hmm. and you put the test strip in it or you pour it onto the test strip, depends on the manufacturer, and it'll tell you whether or not it has fentanyl in it. Now, it won't tell you the amount of fentanyl mm-hmm. that's in it, but it'll tell you if it's there. If it's there. Because in a regular uh, o- opioid that is prescribed there wouldn't be any fit no in there. no if you're getting it from your doctor or from a pharmacist and you're yeah. using it correctly it's not going to be in there but if you're buying it on the street there's a high probability that fentanyl will be in it it's cheaper for the dealer mm-hmm. and they can make more money off of it well i mean i know it's more than a job for you but i'm curious what what kind of made you get into this field and you know i've dealt with SWOT a lot because they do a lot of other you know programs yeah in, in the non uh, not the quit smoking part of that is it part of that same group um, or not that's t set healthy living and um yeah they they partner with us a lot we have the 911 department so anybody who get who needs a 911 address mm-hmm. they call swoda for that um we also have a transportation department we're try we're just now getting that started we're mm-hmm. trying to um get better access to transportation to um, withdrawal centers or treatment centers or just doctor's appointments in general. Right. And then we have our aging department as well. And that and that's handles... what's the ombudsman. That's what that's yeah. one area of most... Yeah, Sherry Nutley, she's our ombudsman. Yeah. She's an amazing person. Yeah. I love her to death. And then we've got you know, we've got services like elderly who are taking care of their grandkids. Or if you're having to take care of a spouse or a loved one because they need round the clock care, um for a disability or an illness of any kind, we actually have a department in our aging department that will pay for respite care. So Mm -hmm. you can take a one or two day break and have a babysitter for those kids or um, a nurse come in and take care of your loved one who needs it. That way you can get a break too. Mental health is, um, it's important. It's important to have a good mental health. So you need those breaks sometimes. I think that it's one of those resources that is definitely um, underappreciated and, and people don't really m- maybe even know about it. Yeah. Yeah. And so, I mean, like, how do they, like, if they want to find out more information about SWOTA, what's the best way for them to maybe either one get in contact or with SWOTA or, you know, with you or what, what's the best way to do that? SWOTA.org, S W O D A. What does SWOTA stand for? Southwestern Oklahoma Development Authority. So they have, it's kind of like Western technology. Do they have different names in different parts of the state, but it's the same organization? No, no we're the only one. <laughs> so there's, that's the only one. That's yeah. The, that's pretty amazing. There are other, we're, we're governmental agencies. So there are other governmental agencies out there and they may do what we do. But mm-hmm. as far as Western Oklahoma, we're it. That's it. Yeah. Well, you guys are covering, you, you're covering several counties. You're covering a large area. So that's definitely. Yeah, and SWOTA services actually only cover eight counties, but um, we were offered these grants. And Mm -hmm. so we have several different grants for different reasons, but they're Mm -hmm. all substance use prevention, treatment, and recovery. Um, There's a COSIP grant and a HRSA grant, and we have a mobile truck that is Medicaid-assisted treatment, and it sets up in Greer County and Kiowa County right now. Um, But we partner with Red Rock a lot, and they're actually our provider for our medicated assisted treatment truck. Um, that's so you can come to us and you can get um, things like Suboxone and other um, medications out there that'll help you get off of opioids or and get off of, of it. Yeah, it'll help you manage your withdrawals. We don't have withdrawal treatment centers. Mm-hmm. People call them detox centers, but they're withdrawal treatment Um we don't have those in Western Oklahoma. We don't have a lot of treatment facilities in Western Oklahoma. There are several 
um, outpatient, but not inpatient. Mm-hmm. So, like Red Rock's an outpatient, correct? Yeah, they're, they can actually do both. They have an inpatient as well, but it's small. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not a lot of beds, but they mm-hmm. do what they can. And mm-hmm. so we come together and we try to help anybody who actually wants the help. You know, I think that we talked about stigma earlier, and I mean, there's definitely a stigma when it comes to mental health. That there's a stigma. I, I see a huge stigma when it comes to, you know, addiction. Because what we think of as like a drug addict is these guys sitting on the side of the highway with a sign or whatever at the corner. That's how we think about it. And that may be true, but it's like, the, it's, it, I think that when you're talking about addiction, it crosses all income barriers. Yeah. I mean, you have people that have, you know, what, uh, high income that have struggled with it. It crosses, um, like, gender, women and men, but yes. both dealing with it. And then also you're talking about race. It crosses that. gender. And then what's also amazing to me is that it really does cross like age boundaries too, because you have young kids that are 20 years old or something struggling with drug addiction, but then you have got people that might like my age that are struggling with it. Yeah. It, it, it's, it's not bias. It's not, it happens everywhere. My second day on the job, we actually joined a fentanyl training and there was a gentleman who lived on Skid Row mm-hmm. and um he's addicted to fentanyl and he uh he was a star athlete in high school, graduated with high honors and a full ride scholarship to a division one school mm-hmm. and he hurt his knee and became an addict and mm-hmm. um yeah, he just ruined his whole life. He came from a, a very prominent family, mm-hmm. um, upper class family. It, I think that that's an area. And I just, you know, my last podcast that I did, I think that, um, that's an area that people don't realize. And maybe, you know, it, if people really realized it, that pain or injury can also lead to addiction. And like, if you have, you know, I, I got to think a great example. My son struggled with that. You know, he had three knee surgeries in high school and struggled with, of course, you know, he was in pain and the, the, the pain medication. And, and at that time, for sure, they were just over prescribing, it seemed like the yeah. pain medication. I, I think it's better now, but then you're talking about still somebody with their brain really isn't developed completely yet. And they're dealing with, you know, mind altering chemicals. And so it's, it's, I think it's a, it makes you have a compassion really for people when you start to realize that it's more than just, Hey, I want to get high. It really, you know, you start to see that it's deeper than that. And we're seeing more and more lately, there's a great film on YouTube called Dead on Arrival. Mm -hmm. Um, We're seeing more and more that 14, 15, 16 year olds are buying street drugs, illicit street drugs, Mm -hmm. um, and, and wanting to experiment or they got hurt playing sports and their doctor isn't giving them a prescription anymore they're addicted and they yeah. that they're looking for it on the streets and these fake pills that contain nothing but fentanyl mm-hmm. there are several teenagers who have passed away just by one pill mm-hmm. dead on arrival is a really good film it's a it's a gut riching heartbreaking film please have a box of tissue if you watch it mm-hmm. um but everybody needs to see it i just shared a video a reel on my facebook page yesterday or the day before yesterday 13 year old passed away because he contacted a dealer on snapchat mm-hmm. who brought um what they thought was oxycodone to this boy's backyard mm. and he took it and it was fentanyl and died wow. 13 wow. years old It's crazy. You know, I think, and I don't want to get into the controversy. I don't want to bring you into the controversy of this, but I think it's something to, to definitely talk about. And that's the, the, the problem with, uh, you know, marijuana, medical marijuana is legal in Oklahoma. Yes. And that is kind of, uh, you know, other states like Texas, for example, or don't have that problem with that issue where it's, you know, it's, And it was, you know, overwhelmingly passed by the the citizens of Oklahoma. So it was definitely something that was wanted. Um, But I also know that it seems like there's more because of the way, just like vaping or whatever, the way you can smoke marijuana or whether you can ingest it is so easy and you can hide it that it seems like a lot of the schools are struggling with, you know, their high school kids 
with marijuana, but yet we look at it as a drug and I see both sides of it. It's like maybe it can help and and not, you know, with certain issues that you're having, which is the medical side of it. And then you also see that if it's like something that a kid is taking at a young age that they could become addicted to that too as well. What what are you guys seeing when it comes to like marijuana and and what's your thoughts on that? Well, there is a lot of controversy. Um, we actually have a three minute recording um, of a voicemail um, to one of our coalition coordinators. Um, we had mailed out postcards talking about marijuana misuse, yeah. and and that's really the key word here, misuse. Yeah, and um, a gentleman didn't like the fact that we had mailed one to his house. And so there's a three minute voicemail recording of this guy, very upset calling our coordinator several different names and cussing her out. But really what we're, we're not trying to repeal the Oklahoma medical marijuana act. Mm -hmm. We're not trying to do that at all. We're trying to educate homes that have children in them to please lock your medication up. It is a medication. So please lock your medication up. Mm -hmm. Um, Don't (laughs) sell it to somebody down the street who doesn't have a medical marijuana card. Um, Don't give it to your kids because you think, oh, well, I'm sure they've got ADHD. I'll just go ahead and give them marijuana, which by the way, it wouldn't work like that. (laughs) It doesn't work like that. Um, My son has severe ADHD. Um, and med- medical marijuana would not aid him right. one bit. Um, but we're just trying to educate. Don't sell your marijuana to somebody who doesn't have a card. Don't go get it for somebody who doesn't have a card mm-hmm. um, and and lock it up and keep it away from your children. Yeah. I think that would be a big one. It's like so easy to think that it's not – it's kind of like – junk food or something. Oh, it's not that big a deal if we leave it out. And so gummies look like gummies. Yeah. Yeah. I I just shared, um, Tuesday, my husband sent me, um, a Facebook post from a police department where the local dispensary had alerted the police department that this was the new vape Mm -hmm. that was being marketed and it's highlighters. And I saw that. I saw that. Yeah, you wouldn't know it was where they look. The vape looks like a highlighter, and the the highlighter actually works. Yeah. So you wouldn't even know. Teachers wouldn't know. Yeah, I saw that. That's crazy. I think it, but it goes back to you know the marketing to young kids. I mean, you see it in tobacco. You see it in you know even in this medical marijuana where it's has superhero names and you know it's definitely you know it's it's an issue because you wonder why you know the marketing what's going on with the marketing of it and that's that's policy change right there that Mm -hmm. that's a policy change that needs to happen laws need to be put into effect and that's also what we're trying to do with our grants we have grants in several different counties for opioids marijuana alcohol and stimulants yeah do you think that, I mean, it, it must get discouraging, like seeing people like that are struggling with addiction. I mean, do you see people actually feel like that where they're getting help and, and you feel like that they are recovering? Do you see that too? Do you see both sides of it? I see both sides of it because I've watched my family do it. Yeah. There, there is hardly a member. I used to joke that I am not the black sheep of my family. I'm the white sheep of a family of black sheep. Yeah. <laughs> my my mother um, struggled with addiction. My aunt was in and out. One of my aunts was in and out of prison for addiction. She is now um, a peer recovery specialist. She is leading her local um, Celebrate Recovery group, and she's doing great mm-hmm. things. It's absolutely beautiful to watch her become a sober person. Mm-hmm. I have another aunt um, who struggled with addiction as well, and she um, decided to come clean on her own mm-hmm. um, and push herself through. That's kind of what I did. Um, I became a cocaine addict when I was 19 years old mm-hmm. and um, I ended up getting pregnant with my first son and that's what woke me up and mm-hmm. I decided to become sober then. Yeah. it's I've seen all sides of it. I've seen medicated assisted treatment working. I've seen straight absence and sobriety working. Yeah. Yeah. I've noticed something that, and you know, maybe I won't describe it exactly correctly, but I've noticed maybe it goes back to, uh, like the, the, the stigma, I guess, that we're talking about that, that people like, 
you have this group of people who maybe never struggled with drugs or any kind of addiction, you know, and so it's real hard for them to look at somebody and it's like, hey, why don't you just quit doing it? You know, my dad's a little bit like that. You know, he like he I, I dip tobacco, he dipped tobacco. And then one day I was talking to him and this is probably like 10 years ago. He's like, oh, I quit. I'm like, you quit that easy. Yeah, I quit. Just quit. Sometimes people and you're have, like, wait a minute. After how many ever years, forty, fifty years of doing this, you just quit? No side effects, no. And that's kind of his mentality. Yeah, I just quit. And I see that a lot because there. I think you have a group of people who do not struggle with addiction when it comes to drugs or alcohol or whatever. And they're a in their mind, it's like I would just quit it if it was causing me too many problems. I would just quit, but. And, and I think that the negative of that is, is that you have these people who can't just quit. Yeah. You know, it's not that easy. Um, and then you also see that with mental health. It's like, I, I have a group of friends that have never, ag- ever, ever s- struggled with suicidal tendencies. You know, never. That's never entered their brain. And to me, it kind of blows me away because I feel like my whole life I've struggled with those tendencies, right? Yes. And so it's real hard for them to understand, you know, why I would struggle with that when they haven't ever struggled with that. To them, to them they're like, that's, that's not the first thing that comes to mind when there's problems. It's not even maybe the fifth or sixth, you know, it's, it's down the line. And I think part of like the stigma or part of the struggle is, to understand that it may not suicidal tendencies may not or drug addiction alcohol may not really affect me but it could affect my kids yeah. or it could affect my family or it could and so i think that that's the avenue that i've really been thinking about lately it's like yeah you may not struggle with these things but somebody close to you it's almost a given i i don't know anybody who doesn't know somebody intimately that has not struggled with one of those issues. You know, my best friend and I were just talking about that this morning um, because you may not have the, I wish I could just end this all right now. Right. Thought you don't have that mentality. And I'm, I, I know that there's a biological difference um, between people who use drugs and people who don't. The biological difference for those who can't stop, mm-hmm. they want to, but they can't. It's because it's in their DNA now. It You obviously look for food, right? Mm-hmm. You know when you have to eat. Mm-hmm. Well, their need for that drug is just like needing to eat. Mm-hmm. Uh, their body, their chemistry makeup says that they cannot survive without it. Um, I think there's a bi- biological difference between people who don't have struggles with mental health as well as people who, who do. But there's the ones that sit here and say, I just want to end it right now. You you think about how you're going to end it. But then there's that other silent suicide, mm-hmm. um, as it was referred to on TikTok, um, where people just think, well, if that semi truck would just run my car over right now, I it'd be much better off. Mm-hmm. And the thought process is you didn't do it to yourself. So therefore, it's not selfish. Oh, I went through that. I, I went through exactly what yeah. you're talking about. Because in my case, you know, I'd had so much close family members commit suicide that it was, I mean, it was like, to utter those words out loud, uh, really, it was just, it's not, it wasn't even an option because of all my family had dealt with. Yeah. So in my case, I was basically drinking myself to death. Yeah. You know, so I was doing it and you could blame it on the alcohol, you could blame it on other things. But it, in, in my mind at the time, I'm like, I'm not trying to kill myself or I'm, I don't want to kill myself, but I, if was, I, die, drink, I, I was drinking myself to death, which yeah. is equivalent you know it's self-harm it's you know whatever i um i'm curious that well back to it's funny kind of a it's a circle around what you were talking about it's like it's there's plenty of like stories out there that that where you know it's not a problem until it is a problem right. does that make sense it's yeah. like somebody could say oh i'm drinking is not a problem drinks not a problem and for years go and drinking isn't a problem it doesn't cause them any problems in their family it doesn't cause them any problems at work they're i call them good text paying citizens who just continue <laughs> on 
it's not a problem until it becomes a problem. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think the same thing with drugs. It's like it could, it's not a problem. It may not be a problem for 10 years, but then all of a sudden it becomes a problem. And yeah. when it starts to affect your life, when it starts to, you know, and I think that that's, and the same thing with suicide. I think that it's not a problem until it is a problem. You know, whether it be 100%. a family member or it be you are going through tragedy or trauma or whatever, you know, it's like, I, for me, I was thinking like when my, my cousin killed himself like two years ago, I, you know, again, him and I were really close and it's like, man, those thoughts had kind of been hidden away in me personally. And then here it goes when it's brought up, you know, and yeah. it's like, it's not a problem until it is a problem. And now it's more of a problem, you know, really struggled there more, you know, after that. So now you've dealt with that same issue. You have some of the same issues, right? Yeah. So it, it, tell me about it, it, your brother. He committed suicide. Is that correct? Yes, he did. Um, but just you have to go back a little bit further than that. Um, when I was 15 years old, um, I had an uncle that committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And that uncle was very, very, very close to us. Um, he was a father figure. I always looked up to him. My brothers always looked up to him. And um, it was a really heartbreaking time for us. Um, mm -hmm. We would have never expected this uncle to even try to commit suicide. Mm -hmm. um, so then again, there's no, there's no bias there. It, it'll find anybody. And uh, so he, he, he ended his life. His name was Bobby Joe Wooten. Mm -hmm. And um, so further on down the road, my brother has always had a little bit of mental health issues. My mother had massive mental health issues. My mm -hmm. mother was bipolar and um, she had enough manic breaks that um, it damaged her brain enough to where she had a lot of paranoid tendencies. Mm -hmm. um, and she was very abusive. Um, my aunts will tell you that she had problems from the get go. Even when she was a child, she had problems. She was a hateful person. She mm -hmm. was a jealous person. And that followed her everywhere. I'm, I'm not actually sure that she ever actually wanted to get help for her mm. mental issues. She did spend several months in um, a mental health facility when I was younger. Yeah. Um, because she had tried to kill herself. She tried to kill herself a few times. Um, but this particular time she had my brothers in the van with her. It was the middle of the night and she tried to drive off the dam at Elk Lake. And mm -hmm. Aaron, my brother jumped out of the vehicle, which made her awaken. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, so she ended up dropping the boys off at my grandparents' house where I was living at the time because my mother and I never had a great relationship. Yeah. And um, the next day, Foss DHS showed up and took my brothers into DHS custody. Mm. Aaron bounced around a, several really bad foster homes where he was mentally, emotionally, physically abused in multiple ways. Um, he ended up in a mental health facility. Um, we called it DNE when I was younger. I don't know what the facility actually was, mm -hmm. but it's diagnosed and evaluation. And um, he was put on a bunch of medication. Mm -hmm. And I truly think that that's where they went wrong. It altered his brain chemistry as mm -hmm. well as his biology. And he suffered from problems after that. Um, he was a pathological liar. Mm -hmm. um, he he was a dreamer, but he was still my baby brother, and mm -hmm. I loved him very much. Yeah. Um, and actually, Monday will be four years. On August 21st of 2019, he committed suicide. Wow. I had had him in a mental health facility prior to that. He had tried to commit suicide as well. A girlfriend had broken up with him. And mm -hmm. um, so I ended up having to call an ambulance. I called the police one night. It took nine people to get him loaded on the gurney. He did not want to go. He did not want to live. Um, he went to Red Rock mm -hmm. and was seeking therapy. We had to go to court. The courts had taken his rights away. Mm -hmm. He wasn't supposed to have access to electronic devices. He was required to live with my grandparents. Um, he wasn't supposed to drive. He wasn't supposed to do a lot of the things. And and he didn't follow those rules. He ended up getting a job. And um, 
He had access to a phone. He called a Marine Corps recruiter. Mm -hmm. And um, the courts had given, ended up giving him a little bit more privilege. All of a sudden, he could have a phone. He could drive. He could do the things. But he still had to live with my grandparents. And um, he ended up getting with that recruiter and signing up. The recruiter pushed through the paperwork. Mm -hmm. Don't ask me how. I don't understand it. But um, so he went to basic at San Diego. Mm. And he ended up spending eight months in basic because two different times he tried to kill himself. Mm. Um, So he ended up being placed in the medical ward. And they ended up sending him home to us. He never fully graduated, but... He got discharged with honors. He got to keep his medical benefits. Um, he came home and he just wasn't him anymore. Mm, yeah. Um, he was working back at the job he had prior to that, um, for a grocery store here. And, um, they accused him of stealing money. Mm-hmm. Actually had a warrant out for his arrest. And, um, when the warrant was placed in the newspaper, that was enough to push him over the edge. Yeah. He bought a gun from a local dealer and shot himself in a church parking lot. Oh gosh. I am so sorry. I uh it's just it's just it amazes me that like when you hear the story, it's like it starts way back here and it just compounds, you know. And like me, I we struggled with those, like, you know, of course, guilt. Oh, my gosh, just struggle with guilt. What could, should have, could have, would have. That's what I always like. We should have, could have. But then you start to realize as you heal personally from it, like you realize there's nothing you could have done differently. It's like, you know, but the guilt at the beginning uh, is pretty rough. And so I'm sure you experience the guilt, too. It's like it's. I still experience it, even though I know there was no, I, I know I did everything I could. I still yeah. feel like I could have done more. I fought so hard for him. It was ridiculous. I fought so hard in court for him. Um, he was more like my child. He lived, he lived with us up until I had to call the ambulance that night. And, um, it was just, I, I've always felt, I'll always feel like I can do more. I'll always feel like I could have prevented it, but mm-hmm. I know I couldn't. He was going to do it no matter what. Yeah. He proved that time and time again. Um, but I wish I could have saved him. Yeah. Well, you, when you think about, when you think about the, the past and his situation, like me, I, what I realize is that again, both of my cousins committed suicide and their brothers. And then, you know, my aunt, it's like her two kids. So it's like, that was a big part of it. Part of like the experience. There's more, but what I, when I, of course, I spent tons of time analyzing it. It's like when my first cousin kills himself, me and his brother, would talk about it, you know, and like really, I guess, kind of analyze it and try to figure out why and what we thought. And then, you know, when he, when he did it, it was so devastating because I'm like, you know, of course the, the, what had happened to his brother, but like what we noticed with, with them is that alcohol was involved. That was a big deal. Mm -hmm. And then we also noticed, and you mentioned it with your brother is like a relationship like problem. You know what I mean? And so as you have analyzed and thought about like that whole situation, is there any conclusions that you've come to like these things kind of were contributing factors in what happened? Oh, there's there was a ton of contributing factors. Yeah. The way we grew up, the way we were raised, the people we were raised around, the things that happened. I mean there wasn't one thing that Aaron had really going for him except for the family that he had left. Mm-hmm. My grandparents loved him intensely and I loved him intensely. Um, but we were all he had and mm. the negative, the world, the negativity just kept beating him down. Aaron loved so much to help others out. I thought that would be his saving grace mm-hmm. and it wasn't, he was just such a burdened person. Um, I think about celebrities who have committed suicide, especially, um, and why did the name just, 
I just forgot. You're talking about the, the one that, like, Good Morning Vietnam? Yes. That's the thing. Come, yeah, Robin, Robin Williams. Williams. Yes. How did I just forget that? I, I, just, I know. I, I know. talk about it all the time. That was, Aaron idolized him. Yeah. Absolutely, positively idolized him. Mm-hmm. Every movie that, I mean, those were his favorite movies. And actually, my husband actually got to meet Robin Williams um, one time in Oregon. We were in an ice cream shop. Um, my oldest son was just a baby. Um, I became too nervous to go over and speak with him, but my husband actually went over and speak with him. We were the only people in the shop at the time besides mm-hmm. those that were working. And he was in a rehab facility close by. There's, there's a celebrity rehab facility on the mm-hmm. coast in Oregon. It's a beautiful place. Um, just for relaxation, some counseling. And th- it was not long after that, that he ended mm-hmm. up committing suicide. And I, I feel like a lot of that, a lot of those suicides that are in the news have a, com- an effect on everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, if they can't make it through that, how am I going to make yeah. it through? I think you actually bring up a great point. And, you know, one of our board members is, uh, he's the head of the soup. He's a superintendent of, uh, Corpus Christi schools in Texas. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and he brought up this issue. He's like, you know, like where we're talking about as an organization, we would love to go out into schools and be able to talk and want to be able to address certain issues, of course. But, you know, he brings the issue. It's like if we go in there and you start talking about suicide and you start, you know, educating and then you leave, they're stuck with the, yeah, you know, the results of it. Because now maybe a kid who wasn't thinking about it now starts thinking about it, you know, more, you know, like verbally or, you know, a lot more prominent. And so I see the point. And then, you know, we're talking, we saw this happen and we, you know, want the last guest again, she was from here. Her daughter committed suicide. Uh, she was 16. And when you look at that scenario, whenever the counselors at that school started talking to the students, now the, the uh, presence of, uh, suicidal tendency is like through the roof because people are now it's in their mind. Yeah. And so what a tough way to figure, you know, that's a tough thing to try to figure out. It's You're like, trying to prevent something from happening, but at the same time, are you doing more harm than good? Yeah. Does the risk outweigh the benefits or does the benefits outweigh the risk? And it wasn't long. I think I know who you were talking about. And it wasn't long after that, that um, we actually had a company come in um, B3 bullying came in and spoke at Elk City Public Schools and they brought up suicide. And Mm. there were some kids in there that may have been too young to listen to that. And it was shocking to see how many kids raised their hands and the same issue was brought up. We just put that in their mind. Yeah. Um, Sometimes you feel a little defeated. Sometimes it feels like you can't win for losing. Yeah. But we still need to talk about it. It's still Mm -hmm. affecting everybody. It's in the news. It's in our movies. It's in our TV shows. It's absolutely everywhere. Yeah. I, um, I think like, I know back to like at my point of like being very depressed or whatever about all this. I, uh, when I was contemplating these things, I, I like at times not healthy, but I would look at my cousin and be like, you know, he's, he, he has courage and I'm a coward because I can't do, you know, I can't pull off what he pulled off. And at least he was, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Not, obviously that's not the right way of thinking, but that's how my brain would go at those times. I would think that he had courage because he had done what he done, did and I didn't because I just couldn't do it, you know? It's a and, double-edged sword. Isn't that crazy? And, but the thing about it is, you know, that the real, and I hate, and like, Man, I think about like their kids because they had kids, yeah. you know, and it's like no father, not at their wedding, not at their graduation, not at any birthdays. And it's like um, you quit. They quit, you know, and that's so tough to just think about and just like, you know, to be able to go through. It's like what was going on in their head at that time? I think a lot about that. What was going on in their head, you know? And I think, like in, in their in their case, alcohol definitely was a contributing factor where they weren't thinking clearly, you know. Too, so I think about that a lot. It's like, you know, you can have somebody who's medically like a bipolar, like in other words, me- mental illness, like bipolar, schizophrenic, or any of that, and it's like the medication gets messed up. 
There's no doubt when you meet people who are truly bipolar or schizophrenic or th- those two examples that medication has to be a part of the equation because the extreme highs and the extreme lows, you cannot talk common sense or, you know, you can't talk it's not logical. them down. Yeah, you can't logically, you know, talk to them and try to get them to think logically. That's the way my mother was. Um I, I do believe my mother self-medicated a lot. Um, I think that she was just born with mental illness. Um, like my aunt said, she dealt with it her entire life. And it was 11 months to the day exactly after my brother killed himself that they found my mother dead mm. from suicide. Wow. She couldn't take it anymore. I'm sure she couldn't take Uh, the upcoming anniversary of his death. Mm -hmm. I'm sure she felt extreme guilt over the way that she raised us and the way Mm -hmm. that she treated us. I'm, I'm sure of that. Um, and it's kind of, I still fight because my brother was such a great person. My mother was not the best person, but she was still my mother. And with Aaron, I feel like is the worst thing that could have happened. The worst thing that he could have done. I go through all the emotions over and over and over again, um, the guilt, the, the remorse, the sadness, the mm-hmm. anger. And, um, but with mom, I hate to say that she's, that this is better for her. Mm-hmm. My mom, my mother was so sick, not just mental health sick. My mother had two factors for RA and she was in extreme pain 24 mm-hmm. seven. My mother was also on chemo, um, mm-hmm. which we know can biologically alter your entire body, your brain chemistry, all of it. Um, there's no telling where her mind was at that time. Um, she had blocked me from everything, from her phone, from social media, from all of it. Mm-hmm. Um, three, four months before she committed suicide. Yeah. Um, she wrote two different letters, um, both of them contradicting the other, one telling me she loved me, the other telling me she hated me. Mm. Um, and I wouldn't, I would not say that she deserved to go through what she went through though. Yeah. She was still my mother and I loved her and I wish yeah. she hadn't, I wish that that's, I wish that wasn't the way she ended at all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm uh, how, how old was your brother when he committed suicide? Mm, Do you 2019, 20, mm, man, he was 29 years old. It was yeah. just before his 30th birthday. Wow. He would have been 30 December 2nd, 2019 or 2020. Sorry. He was yeah. 28. Sorry. Yeah. He would have turned 30 in 2020. Yeah. That's, so heartbreaking. Um, I'm curious, like, what has helped you? You know what I mean? I'm I'm always curious about that. Because like, I think about my own journey, I think about people I've talked to, I love to hear what has helped them. I don't think there's anybody like that's gone through any of this stuff that can easily say, Oh, it's all basically everything's wonderful now. And, yeah. everything's, and, and so I think that that is never going to happen where everything's just wonderful and no problems. You know, I think it's, but I'm curious the things that you feel like that have made a difference for you. Like, man, this really helped maybe in the grieving process, or it really helped me deal with this. Personal development. Like? Um, I, I have, I've gone through so many different books that are personal development, but really, um, the body keeps the score. I can't remember who wrote it. Mm-hmm. Um, you can listen to it on Audible, or you can buy it on Amazon. Um, but actually, learning our traumatic responses, our biological responses to trauma, has helped me understand mm-hmm. what they went through. It's helped me understand what I went through. Um, forgiveness is a huge piece. Mm-hmm. Um, understanding that it's not your fault is a huge piece, but I still struggle on a daily basis. Mm-hmm. I still find myself not fully healed from it. Yeah. Um, one thing that was told to me once, there's some days that I wake up and I just, I can't do anything. I don't want to talk to anybody. My depression gets really deep and I, I, pull myself into my bed under my bed sheets mm-hmm. and I don't want to move. Um, but one thing somebody shared with me is that grief is like glitter. Mm-hmm. 
you can clean up the bulk of the mess, but it's still always hiding in the cracks. Yeah. And every once in a while, you'll find a piece. And I think that that understanding that not every day has to be perfect. You have to grieve. You have to sit back and listen to your body, listen to your mind, give yourself what you need, um, and finding help, finding those that will listen, therapy, um, whether it's religion, whether it's your pastor, Mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. None of it has to look the same, but you do have to take care of yourself most of all. Mm -hmm. I think that Aaron didn't take care of himself. I know my mom didn't take care of himself, and I think that's what led them to where they went. Yeah. So our only way to combat this is to break the stigma of mental health because God knows that uh, people look down on those of us that have mental health issues. Mm-hmm. Um, I think breaking that stigma and l- allowing people to talk about it and allowing people to seek help is going to be. Yeah. I'm actually amazed by, you know, it's really been, uh, you know, it's been something that's been heavily on my mind. It started out at work, really. It didn't start out with mental health or whatever, but it's just the, the idea that people do not want to get help. Like they're scared to get help. Like this is most, a lot of people's vision of getting help. Let's say they're having suicidal thoughts. Then they're afraid that they're going to go get locked up. They're going to be in a padded room. They're going to, you know, all kinds of any, uh, stuff you've seen on TV. And, you know, there probably is a little truth to it. That's the sad part because, you know, they're going to try to keep you safe. But on the same point, it's like, um, you know, the, the, what we, I think it keeps us from asking for help, you know, because we don't want people to think we're weak and we don't want people to think we're struggling with something. And I think that in, for me, any avenue where I can hear somebody else say they're struggling with the same thing that I'm struggling with, that has made a big impact. I love how, you know, it's, you've probably heard this before. It's like, look for the similarities, not the differences. Yeah. And it's like when I hear your story, I mean, our our stories are not exactly right, the same, you know, and I'm saying they're different. But if I and listen to your story and I pick out the similarities and I'm like, my gosh, you know, I, it feels good to me. Not that I want that to happen to somebody else, but that, it feels good that I can relate to what you're saying, that you, I'm not the only one who struggled with that. And I think finding those communities is very, is is tough meaning people that have dealt with stuff and that are not, their lives aren't perfect. I I think that it's so easy in this world to like make you, make it seem like put on this mask or this face that everything's perfect. You know, my life is perfect. You know, I don't well, have that's any social media too. Yeah, oh, I think it absolutely. feeds into the problem. Hey, absolutely. look at me. This is great. I'm going on these trips. I bought this new car. Never yeah. mind that I'm having yeah. to work myself to death to pay for them. Yeah. Or I, it's it's okay to talk about. It's okay to not be okay. And yeah. everybody needs to understand that. And a lot of people, like you said, they, they worry about if they go find that help, are mm-hmm. they going to end up locked up? Are they going to end up losing their job? Are they going to lose mm-hmm. their house because they can't work? All these different things flood your mind. Um, I know I've been there personally. Um, if I go down to Red Rock and I tell them I have these suicidal ideations, or if I find a therapist, or I go to the ER, ER are they gonna are they gonna send me away for six months? Mm-hmm. Um, what am I gonna do about my kids? What am I gonna do about my house? But it's important that we go talk to a therapist, that we find somebody that can help us, and. Not every situation is the same. If if you're thinking, oh, what am I going to do about my house? Mm-hmm. That's a bonus for you. You need to go talk to that therapist. A lot of times there's outpatient therapy that'll help. It's not always an inpatient therapy. Yeah. That's a great, you put it a great way is that it's like, if you're thinking about those things, like I'm worried about my job, I'm worried about my house, you know, that shows some hope actually. And I think that's great. It's a will to, to live. It. I mean, it really is. And, and you know, that mental health, <clears throat> and suicidal tendencies, all those things, they contradict, we contradict ourselves in our own thinking. You know, we're at one moment worried about our job and our house, but the next minute we want to die. 
you know, one minute we're worried about our kids, but then the next might want to die. And I think that that just shows the illogical thought process that goes through our heads sometimes. It's like we're contradicting. You even mentioned it with your mom is like writing two different letters that contradict yeah. each other. And I think that speaks to what's going on at in our head at that time. You know, it's like illogical thoughts. It's like what, it, you know, it's like, I don't know, like for me also, you know, um, I like, you know, I, a lot of people don't know this, but I attempted suicide when I was 17 and it was a, you know, I was in the hospital for several days and, but the gist of it, it of that for me, that my experience of it was that I was so embarrassed about what had happened. Yeah because of my age and I didn't want my friends to know and I didn't want, and, and really I never even talked about that until recently, you know, because embarrassment of it. And, but here's the thing that I really realized about myself is that when it comes to that situation, which was years and years and years ago, I chalked it up as like, Oh, it wasn't a serious attempt. Even though I was in the hospital for like five we days. We downplay our You know, I downplayed illness. that and say, well, but it wasn't a serious attempt. It was just, you know, half-ass attempt. And you think about and 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 that's made me realize and grow as a person to like, look at what I'm doing about my own story. You yeah. know, I'm downplaying that to something that is not that important, you know. You know, and I think about my, um, you know, my oldest cousin, he... Uh, like had these moments where he'd call and, and, and drinking and then driving crazy drinking. And you play those moments down as he's just drunk and acting stupid. Young but kid it, having it, fun. It, it is not, you know, now when you think about it in light of what's happened, it's not funny. And it's not, it's, it was a very serious cry out for help, you know, that you, you, you realize that it was there now, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm I'm curious about you, like your support. Like again, I I realize like in, even in my own like everything's not perfect. I you know I still have struggles, and I know you do too. But what like where do you feel like you got some support from? Like when going through this stuff. Like did you find little areas of support from other people or from different things? And anything that you felt like was really supported you and helped you through this. I am lucky enough to say that I have the best friends mm -hmm. that a girl could ever have, that anybody could ever have. Yeah. Um, they really came together for me and um, banded together for me. And just the little things. Mm -hmm. um, after Aaron killed himself, I couldn't get up off my living room floor. I was balled up in the fetal position, still crying. Yeah. I couldn't get up off my living room floor to go take care of my children or to go. I, luckily my husband was home for all of that, but I, they got together. I couldn't go get toilet paper. My house didn't even have toilet paper. Mm -hmm. And I felt like a failure because here I am wrapped up in myself and my own thoughts and my own grief that I can't even take care of anybody else that I I'm required to take care of. Mm -hmm. And, but they got together and they helped take care of my kids. They went to the store for me. They cleaned my house for me. Mm -hmm. Um, and they're still there for me every day. We still check in with each other every day. My brother was their friend too. Mm -hmm. Um, my Herbalife, I, I also sell Herbalife. Um, I know MLM pyramid scheme, but it really isn't. Um, it, it's actually been a great addition to my life because there was such a large community there mm -hmm. that could come together and several of them knew exactly what I was going through. They've been there before. And, um, so they, they banded together to help take care of my business mm -hmm. and, um, keep my doors open and still keep me making money. Therefore I could pay for my brother's funeral and I could mm. pay for, I could afford to be home and not at work, um, taking care of my children. Um, and really that's just been our large support. I honestly haven't been in therapy since then. Mm. Um, I do regular, several of my friends are therapists, so I do kind of lean on them a little bit. Yeah. Um, and they're there for me there with that aspect. Um, but my church community, my best friends mm -hmm. and my Herbalife family, 
that's what we call each other as a family. You and, brought us some great stuff. And one, you know, and Emily's in the room that people can't see her, but she's she she'll remember this like in my presentation to the board and what our plan is as the organization is is that if you take one of the areas like you take business for example and man, it can make a big impact, it meaning can. that I'm working on something, I have goals, even though like the rest of your life may feel like it's falling apart. If you have like this one area and business is one of them. And also when we talk about mental health, obviously that area or physical, you know, but I think that it's a great reminder from what you're saying, because I know a lady right now who, who's a recovering addict. She's been um, sober for four or five years and she's really big into Thrive, which is a kind yeah. of, they consider a multi-level marketing, but that has been like her safe place and a place that she's gotten support and the place that she feels like she's successful. And, and I think that it's so easy to discount those little things because we think, oh, it's not quote, people think that's not me, but it's not a real business. Yeah. It's not, but, and, and man, the fact that it does provide some, you know, outlet or some kind of community. It, it really, and I, it's so easy to discount that, but you, you just said it. And I've experienced the same thing, you know, where I'm like, okay, this one area has really, even though I didn't realize it at the time, you know, I was concentrating on it. I was focused on it. I was thinking about it. Um, I know one of the things that people, some, I want to say my aunt did this for me, maybe somebody else too, but I have a friend that's a social worker. She definitely helped with this, but it gave me almost permission to like grieve, you know, and, and you mentioned it, like the story you're talking about laying on the floor in the living room and bawling. I have this crazy, you know, I have this friend and he's helped us too with the not-for-profit and his name's Brian. And uh, there's an incident where I basically was trying to fix some plumbing uh, and I'm out there and I just lose it and I'm bawling and I'm laying on the ground prostrate out in the, and, and he comes up and just helps me fix it. Yeah. Does it make sense? Yeah, absolutely. And that's all. And, you know, he didn't have much to say. I, and like what I, my thought about that experience now is at that moment, I had several of those moments, but at that moment, I didn't give a shit if somebody saw me cry, yeah. lose my shit. I always call it losing my shit. I, I literally didn't care. And that, you know, you switch from caring what people are going to think or say to, I don't care what they say or what people think. Yeah. I don't care. And I had, and I, you know, switched over to that. And then I think about now there's several incidents where I switched into that, where I just don't care. Yeah. I'm going to lose my shit and whether y'all like it or not kind of attitude. Yeah. And that was actually pretty powerful when it, when I think back on it. It's like it's pretty powerful because it also got me over this deal. It's like quit masking that this is really a big deal. Quit masking. Yeah. You found a support. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I guess that was my point. It's like after – those incidents and talking to like my aunt and, but, you know, I always felt guilty for talking to my aunt about it. She had lost two sons, two kids. You know, I've never lost a kid. I have five kids and I think I can't even imagine what that would no. look like. Right. And so like, I think most parents, they would say that there is nothing worse than the idea of losing your kid. And so I think about that and and the fact that she lost two kids and yet she was still supportive and like really saying, Hey, I'm get you have, you can grieve any way you want. If you want to flip out, you want to act crazy. You know what I mean? I, I, yes, nobody wants to get violent, but you get my point. It's like, she gave me permission and it was coming from somebody who number one knew, but also coming from somebody who was hurting too. And I think that that was a big deal for me. Mm -hmm. I had a similar incident. Um, it was not me losing it, though. My grandfather is a very proud man. Yeah. And um, when my uncle shot himself, my grandfather was distraught, but we never saw him cry. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he cried. I'm sure he cried in private. He was not going to cry in front of us. It was several years later um, when I was four years old, my uncle Jesse ran away. Mm -hmm. I can't, I don't really remember how old he was, maybe 15 or 16. 
Um, but several years after my uncle um, shot himself, we found out that my uncle Jesse had been found dead, I think, in New Mexico. He was killed execution style, cartel style. Oh, gosh. Um, and, and my grandfather um, stayed silent for several days. Mm-hmm. He... He's, he was always a working strong man, um, always kept himself busy. And, um, we watched him grieve a little bit with that one. He never cried in front of us, but we watched him grieve. He stayed mm-hmm. silent. He slept in more. He stayed by himself more, didn't mm-hmm. want to really be around people. But, and it was similar when Aaron died. It took him several weeks to kind of get back to himself. My mother died. He was just kind of angry about it. That one, he showed a lot of anger, but it was three weeks after my mother killed herself that my other uncle died in a motorcycle accident. Mm. We had their funerals together. And um, I think that's when I really figured out that it's okay, that I'm not okay because my grandfather cried Mm -hmm. and could not, he couldn't hold it in any longer. He had had enough that that was it. And the fact that he showed me that it's okay to not be okay. Yeah, yeah. I think that it, go, it speaks to what we've been talking about, which is, you know, if we're like, if we're o- open and honest and vulnerable about really what's going on in our lives, and I, I think about like even one less this organization, it's like, if I'm open and honest in my own personal story, yeah. you know what I mean. And just like you, I have to deal with business. I have to deal with customers and clients, and you know what I mean. I. I Community. We still have our like, day to day life. You know, one of my worries, you know, before I went to seek treatment for alcohol was, is that what is the people, what is my customer clients, whatever, what are people going to think in the community when they find out? And for me to get over that was such a huge deal. And it's like now I'm realizing that I have to be super open, super vulnerable, you know, uh, and honest about what's going on. And it's because of exactly what you just said. It's like by your grandfather having that vulnerable moment, he opened it up really for you to have one too. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like this graduation into that area where you can heal, I guess. I don't know. So, I, I always thought that he was just the strongest guy I knew. Yeah. And and he, he, he was, I mean, he had a stroke um, a little, a year and a half ago. And so he's not, the strongest man, but he's still the strongest man in my eyes. Mm-hmm. He's he lost all three of his sons. No, yeah. um, and he's still living through it all. Yeah. I and for him to finally open up to us like that, oh, no, yeah, it's tough. It was it was a beautiful moment. Honestly, it was the saddest moment, but it was also very beautiful. No, yeah. I don't know. Life is tough. You know, I listen to your story and I'm like, I listen to other people's story and I'm like, I'm like, you know, life is tough. And I always, you know, like we said earlier, it's like, if it's not tough for you, just wait a little bit. Yeah. You know, it's gonna, it, it happens. But you have people, it's like, they've had kind of like your story. It's like, they've had a tough time right from the beginning, you know, how they grew up and their parents or whatever. And then you have people that toughness comes later, but it comes knocking at the door. It doesn't matter when. But it happens, and and again, that's how I feel like we relate to each other. You know, it's like, oh, Lee, and you it, know, it I'm gets, not the only one, though. You know, yeah, it gets a little disheartening sometimes because this morning my best friend tells me you're the strongest person I know. You're so strong, and I told her I was like, do you ever feel like why why do I have to be this strong? Why yeah. is it me that has to go through this? Can you just give me a break for one moment? Yeah. But then I realize my story is important, and mm-hmm. it might save somebody else one day. Absolutely. I, when I, I mean, I don't know if you completely realize this, but and I hope people that listen to this um, pick up on it, like what I pick up on. But I'm like, I'm listening to your story, and it really it, inspiring. It like helps me. It helps me, and like it's such a great example of like how your own personal story can, can really inspire somebody. And, and I mean, I'm saying that because 
more importantly, it's real. And the, what I mean by it's real is like, you're not putting on this air of like, I got all my stuff together. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so that becomes super real because I'm like, man, I don't have to have all my stuff together either. And I can, you know, I can figure a way through life. You hear all this all the time, like whether it, lots of programs, the Bible talks about like one day at a time, but really sometimes that's the only way you can do one moment at a time dealing yeah. with grief, one moment at a time dealing with whatever that comes along in life. Because that's the thing. It's like, you know, something is going to happen, but you can't live in that, that place of like, doom and gloom no. you know what i mean you have to live in this place or because like us having kids it's like man you're gonna if you have kids it's like your kids are gonna you're, we're gonna do the same things that our parents did to us to them and, you know in our house it's extremely important within our house that we talk about our mental health because my children had to go through the fact that their favorite uncle, sorry mm -hmm. to my other brothers, <laughs> but their favorite uncle, the one that they were close with, so mm -hmm. very close with, they might as well have been brothers themselves. Um, oh, my brother Aaron was so amazing to them and mm -hmm. they lost him. Mm -hmm. Um, my, my, both my children have been diagnosed with PTSD because of it. Um, they've both had to go through years of therapy because of it. Right. And, it's extremely important in our house that we are open and honest about the days that are bad days, as well as the days that are good days. Um, we celebrate that you made it through just another day. If you can just keep going one more day, if you can do this one more day, um, right. then you'll make it through. Yeah, It's really hard for them to have to see their mother break down the way she does. And for a long time I had to, I thought I should hide it from them, but in realizing that my grandfather could no longer hide it mm. and the way it inspired me, I realized I can't hide it from them either. We all have to be honest about it. And I think it's helped them a lot. Um, my oldest son, he's 16. He's mm -hmm. a junior in high school and he's become an amazing person. We struggled there for a little bit yeah. and I can understand why we struggled. Um, but he uh, he's going to WTC now, and he's in a welding program, and he's looking forward to the future. And I feel like his struggle is getting a little bit easier. Mm -hmm. um, he's actually graduated from therapy. He no longer has to go to yeah. therapy, which is a blessing. Um, I, I pray for him every day that he still manages to remember what he was taught in therapy. Mm -hmm. Um and I hope he makes it through his struggles. Yeah. Well, being a teenager is hard. God. I, People do not. If you don't have teenagers, like, uh, it's just tough. And in and, and their world, like, something, happen, something happens at school, then that's their world. You know, it's like one one argument with a friend could turn. It's just they feel like their whole life's, you know, over. I or, can't even imagine what it's like to be a teenager in this day and age because when I was a teenager— yeah, cell phones were just starting. Yeah. And the internet was there, but it was something that you went down to the library for. It wasn't in every home. Mm -hmm. It wasn't yeah. chat rooms were not a big thing. Facebook didn't exist. MySpace didn't exist. Yeah. They these kids nowadays, they have to deal with it twenty four seven. They don't get a break when they get off the bus at four o'clock. Right. It's still haunting them. People are still terrorizing them. People are still bullying them. And it doesn't end. I I can't imagine what they go through. I I'm I try to I try to be an open book for my kids as well as let them be open books to me. I don't if they're going through something. Um, I I don't get enraged if if um if they end up at a drunk at a party. I'm not the type of mom that's going to be like grounding them or mad at them mm -hmm. we're going to have a discussion about it because we can't have a discussion because that's just one piece of their life yeah. and my best friend constantly has to remind me every day that their worst day is still their worst day yeah well i think that it's like especially when it comes to teenagers it's all of us but it's like everything is a season and oh my god you know now that high school is nothing. <laughs> no. You know what I mean? But when you're in high school, it's like the biggest thing in the world. And I get it. 
because for me during that time, I thought it was the biggest thing in the world. It was my life. But then I'm thinking like now it's like, I can't even tell you who I went to high school with really. I mean, maybe right. can tell you one or two, but I don't, I had somebody recently asked me who my favorite teacher was in high school. I was like, can't name one. And I mean, it's not that they were bad teachers or I cannot name one teacher, you know? And I think that that's, yeah, there's some people who live in high school, you know, live in the glory days. But for me, it's like, it's just a season. And I think that same thing happens with, you know, all of our life. It's like, it may feel really bad today, but tomorrow it may completely feel different. And I think it just, you know, make it through today. You know, it's kind of sometimes the mentality is have to make it through today, you know, so... Well, Deshaun, I sure appreciate you taking the time and sharing your story and being vulnerable. And I think, man, I, I like you, your story really inspires me. And I mean, I think you're an amazing person and I think you're amazing for the right reasons, which is, you know, it takes a lot of courage to share what is going on in your life. And so, but if we don't, yeah, yeah. Well, if we don't, then. Uh, you, you know what, the, what will happen if we don't is that we will never have any real connections. We'll never right. have anything real. Everything will be internet and social media and bulls, you know, bull crap, basically. And I think that it's like the only way to build is, is just that through the, that's the best way is through honesty and vulnerability and, you know, and I've gone through that where I didn't think that I wanted to share because of what people thought, like I said. So I'm glad you did. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I love yeah. what y'all are doing. Is there, if people want to, once the podcast is posted or even people listening on TikTok, is, what's a good way for people to reach out to you? It might be an email or what? what's the best way if they want to reach out to you or they want to get to know more about you. Is there a way that they can do that? You can find me on Facebook, Deshauna Smythe, S-M-Y-T-H is how you spell my last name. Um, you can uh, message me there. My email is Deshauna Smythe at gmail.com. That's D-E-S-H-A-W-N-A-S-M-Y-T-H at gmail.com. Or everybody in this world, everybody in this town already probably knows my cell phone number. I've had it out there for such a long time, yeah. but it's 580-799-7192. You can text me, you can call me. Um, even if it's in the middle of the night, I've had a few of those phone calls actually where I've just had to talk to somebody for a little yeah. bit. They just wanted somebody to hear them. Call me, text me, email me, find me on Facebook. I am on Instagram, but I'm not that big on Instagram. I rarely check it. So... Yeah. Well, thank you so much. And, and just a reminder to everybody, again, check out our website, evenoneless.com. Uh, there's some great resources on there. If SWOTA isn't part of our resource, I'm sure it will be, but it's, it's, uh, I'm, we're working on our resource page. And, and then also don't forget about our event on September 16th at six o'clock at uh, 105 South Main at United Country Exploration Realty here in Elk City, Oklahoma. It's really not that far from anywhere. So no, it's not. It's right downtown on Main Street too. I'm going to, yeah. And Elk City is a great town and there's a lot of good stuff going on here. And what else? Oh, uh, Route 66. Route 66. I never thought it was that big a deal, but I've come to find out it's, it's huge. A, it's a big deal. I had people come from the UK to visit and they were like, they knew more about Route 66. My so. husband was one of those. It's like, I am amazed by the people's interest in Route 66. And we are on right, right on Route 66. Absolutely. So it's a great visit. And halfway in between Amarillo, uh, Texas, and Oklahoma City. That's how I always describe it. Yeah, right off I-40. So it's an easy drive. So thank you again. Thank Hope you. you guys have a great day. Thank you for listening to Positively Undefeated. If there was something in this show that resonated with you, please share the show with your community. If you want this show delivered each Monday morning to your podcast app of choice, please subscribe or follow. And if you'd like to get a hold of Burl, please do so by going to BurlStricker.com forward slash contact.